Welcome to stage C, everybody. EMF cam. Woo! Yeah, that surprised you. Right. Um, we have a great talk coming up now. Uh, we have Leon and Connor in a, talking about making music from gravity waves and the chroma touch dome. Except that there seems to be some technical difficulties happening. Okay, so I'm now going to have to waffle for a bit. Yeah, I think that's good. I'm going to start by introducing us. Okay. So I'm Leon Trimble, a digital artist from Birmingham, currently based at the Pervasive Media Studio in Bristol and uh, the Steam House in, in Digbeth in Birmingham. And uh, I run the Dome, which is just about 100 meters that way. So we've been doing some uh, modular synthesizer uh, visuals and music jams all day and uh, into the wee hours every night. Come and see us tonight. I think we're on till midnight. Um, so I have been hacking lots of devices and um, gaming technology and stuff for years to make visuals and music. Um, and it's a kind of convoluted story. But we're here to talk about the gravity synth today, which is uh, a laser interferometer, which is uh, an instrument for detecting vibrations. And on a massive scale, um, they detect gravitational waves. And Connor's going to give you a, a, a slideshow presentation of how the University of Birmingham and the LIGO team at MIT have been detecting gravitational waves over the past few years. And then I'll go on to uh, describe the instrument we've made with a synthesizer and how that uh, makes crazy noises we can take out and uh, perform with. Yeah, we've been changed it, so it's uh, it's ended. Um, that one. Okay, so then this one's gonna be So the performances in the dome have been um, put on by a group of different friends. We got asked by EMF to bring the dome after being recommended by the live code musicians who were here last year. The Algo Rave guys. Um, ironically, they've got their own festival happening this weekend in Leeds, so none of them could come and perform. Um, so uh, that was a real shame. Um, I'll let Connor take over. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, so just like Leon said, I'm Connor Gettins. I'm a PhD student at the University of Birmingham uh, working on gravity. And I'm going to introduce uh, the science behind the gravity synth. <clears throat> so, I'll uh, just give you an introduction to it. Uh, it kind of started as a collaboration between our research group in Birmingham and with Leon. And the idea was to use science to produce a synthesizer, uh, more specifically using an interferometer to generate uh, sound. And uh, let's see, if ho hopefully this will work. Don't, can't hear that. Oh well, no sound, but so that's us like kind of playing about with it and testing it. Oh. Uh, but ultimately, all this is is uh, it's just uh, we're using interferometer to generate generate waves, which can then be manipulated just like any synthesizer. This, this was the early days in the uh, the lab underneath uh, the the physics building at the University of Birmingham. And this was an early model of the synth. We've got a bigger and better uh, model on show in the dome. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so sorry, uh, no sound for the videos. Uh, but yeah, like Liam said, that's when we're playing about with it in the lab. 
So, moving on to the science. Why do we always, why is gravity important? Well, up until a few years ago, everything we saw in the universe, everything we observed was uh, from light. Things that admit and scatter light, so electromagnetic radiation. But, uh, you know, the matter which manipulates light only makes up about 5-6% of the whole universe, so we're actually blind to the majority of things out there, uh, specifically dark energy and dark matter, we can't see a thing with it. So, well, we get lovely, uh, lovely images like this from telescopes from like electromagnetic radiation, this is uh, Centurus A. Uh, we're actually missing a lot of stuff out there. So, how do we get, how can we look at the things uh, that, we, that doesn't, you know, give out light, that doesn't reflect and diffract light? Well, rather than looking at the universe, we can try and listen to the universe. Uh, and this is where gravity comes in. So, just a bit of background in gravity. So, our idea of gravity was first formally put down by Galileo. He did a lot of experiments, you know, uh, dropping things from towers, rolling things down inclines. And he found that under the influence of gravity, everything falls, should like, uh, fall at the same acceleration, the acceleration due to local gravity. So if you drop a feather and a hammer in a vacuum, they should fall the exact same rate. Uh, so you can't hear it, but this was uh, on the Apollo 15 mission where they actually tested this experiment on the moon. They dropped a feather and uh, uh, a hammer. And you'll see in a second that they do indeed fall at the same rate. Now, of course, uh, we have done these experiments on there far more precise, precisely than just someone dropping them uh, by hand, and it is indeed true, uh, Galileo was right, things do just fall at the same rate under gravity. The reason we don't see this, like if you were to drop a feather on a hammer right now, of course the feather would drop much more slowly. That's because uh, aerodynamic drag and uh, air resistance. If you take that away, they do fall at the same rate. There you go. And then, after Galileo, Newton came about and he formulated gravity for, uh, into you know, actual equations that we can use and manipulate. And these equations can you know, predict the motions of uh, the stars and the majority of the planets, but it does these equations do break down. They can't, predict the, the, uh, they can't predict precisely the orbit of Mercury, and uh, action at a distance as well assumes that the influence of gravity is everywhere. Uh, it, the information travels faster than the speed of light, which is of course impossible. So, in the presence of strong gravitational fields, Newton's theory breaks down. So then we get on to general relativity. So after Newton, we get Einstein. In 1915, 1916, he publicized his uh, theory of general relativity. And rather than thinking of it being like distinct formal force uh, in action at a distance, he said, okay, well, you know, matter uh, curves space-time, and it says curvature space-time, that's what gives you gravity. Uh, so this little floating diagram here. You can imagine it's being a uniform cuboid. If you put a star at the center, uh, space-time curves in towards it, and that's what gravity is. It's the curvature of space-time. And we get a lot of interesting things predicted from general relativity. It predicts the existence of black holes and gravitational waves, and other things as well, like time dilation. It also allows us to uh, you know, accurately, accurately predict the difference between reference frames. So without general relativity, you wouldn't have a system of satellites around the Earth uh, global communications would not be possible without a theory of general relativity. So the thing that we're interested in is gravitational waves. And uh, these are, if gravity is the influence of uh, the curvature of space-time, gravitational waves are ripples in the space-time. And they're caused by any, any mass that accelerates, any asymmetric mass which accelerates. But of course, everyday objects, including ourselves, the gravitational waves we produce are unimaginably small, even by scientific standards. We have to look at the waves emitted from the largest objects in the universe, interacting in some of the most violent processes uh, you can imagine. So, in general, gravitational waves are quite hard to measure. And to give you an idea of how a gravitational wave influences space-time, it's a, unlike sound waves, which are longitudinal, uh, gravitational waves are transverse. So, if you can imagine uh, this little map here, I'll explain what the shape is in a minute, but if you can imagine uh, a gravitational wave passing either into or directly out of the screen, it affects space-time like this. 
sort of stretches and squeezes space-time. Now, of course, <laughs> it's not as uh, drastic effect as this, uh, unfortunately. Uh, it'd be much easier to measure if it was. So that's what a gravitational wave does. It stretches and squeezes space-time in uh, orthogonal directions to the way it travels. And this L shape here you see in the map, this is uh, one of the interferometers at LIGO. So I'll explain about that in a second. Uh, but yeah, so this L shape is a microson interferometer. And how it works is it uses laser light of a single frequency. And the laser, the laser light shone at a mirror, a beam splitter, which uh, bits it beam 50-50 and directs it towards two mirrors. Uh, and as it does, they, you get, see this wave pattern splitting off. It goes to the mirrors and comes back. And when it comes back to the mirror, it's, it's directed towards a photodiode. Now, these waves uh, we can uh, interfere with each other, uh, either constructively or deconstructively, depending on if they're in phase or not. And what determines the phase is the relative length of these two arms. If they're the exact same length, uh, you know, you'll get uh, constructive interference. If it's slightly off, you'll get deconstructive interference. And as the gravitational wave passes through, it causes, it stretches and squeezes space-time, and we get the relative change in length of these arms. So that's how you get these uh, bright and dark patterns. As the gravitational wave passes through, uh, you'll see a pattern of light and dark. Uh, so if you're the output of this photodiode would look like a sinusoid. And fr um, from a scientific point of view, why do we want to do this? Well, like I said earlier, it's the only way to directly observe things like black holes uh, and also neutron stars. Uh, and these are just some artistic interpretations, but uh, we've made a few detections now uh, over the past few years. Uh, most recent one was quite interesting. It was the first detection of uh, neutron stars colliding. And we had the first direct proof uh, that heavy elements like gold are made in these interactions. Uh, before that was only just theory, but now we know uh, where all the heavy elements on Earth, gold, anything like that, they're all made by colliding neutron stars. And so, just before I go on to back to the, the sound of gravitational waves and, gra and the gravity synth, I'll just show you a little cool clip. So this is a simulation of the very first detection, uh, which was two black holes inspiraling and eventually they collided. And this, this inspiral would have been going on for millions of years uh, but the gravitational waves were only strong enough that we only really caught the last, you know, minute or so uh, at the end of this process. So I'll just play this little simulation. So here we see two black holes inspiring around one another. Uh, the sort of color pattern is the gravitational waves rippling off. And along the bottom, this would be the signal at the output of the interferometer. Now bear in mind, these black holes were over 10 times the mass of the sun. And at this point, they would be moving fat, oh, more than half the speed of light. So this was an incredibly violent process. You wouldn't want to be anywhere near here right now. So then they collide, and then you see the ring down at the end. So you see these ripples spreading out. That's distortions in space-time, uh, the gravitational waves from this event. And this was interesting. It was the first direct detection of black holes. It was also the first, like I said, the first gravitational wave. Uh, so we kind of ticked off a lot of boxes there about things we did for the first time. So I'll just move on finally to the sound of gravitational waves. Like I said, they're just like sound waves, uh, and as such, we can manipulate them to produce, uh, so such that we can actually hear them. Now, the interesting thing at LIGO is that the sound, the, the amplitude, the frequency of these uh, gravitational waves, they're actually in the audible region. You could hear these uh, in the right situations. Of course, their amplitude is so small. I mean, you would never actually hear it with your own ears, but all we need to do is turn up the volume and you tear it. Now, unfortunately, I can't, don't have any sound for this video, but you hear, towards the end, uh, as they collide, you hear a little chirp sound. Uh, unfortunately, I can't play it. Anyway, it'd be a long sort of drone, and then all of a sudden, towards the end, uh, right here, it'd be a very loud chirp. Uh, as the uh, I, can, I can play that afterwards. I can yeah do a YouTube of that. Yeah, we've got more videos after. Anyway, but like I said, gravitational waves are just like sound waves. 
they are transverse rather than longitudinal. So when I say sound waves are longitudinal, they, as they travel along, they adiabatically uh, compress and stretch the air in the direction they travel. But gravitational waves are just the same. Uh, they have a frequency which gives us a pitch, and from the output of an interferometer, they have a definite shape which gives us a tone, the actual feel of the sound. And all we need to do is uh, you know, take the output from a photodiode from this uh, Michelson interferometer, and then hook up to a synthesizer, and there you go. So I'll leave it there, uh, and I'll, just before I uh, bring back Leon back in, he'll actually show you some cool videos about how this, how this actually sounds. Uh, but I'll just finish by saying, uh, feel free to check out our uh, group website. We've got a lot of information, gravitational waves, and the stuff we've done with Leon, and uh, a lot of cool outreach stuff, uh, including app, apps and games as well. So yeah, thanks. Right, so I attended, uh, I was at Birmingham Open Media uh, Studio for a while, and uh, I had a, there was a, a kind of uh, impact for science engagement kind of uh, meeting that happened, and I sat next to one of the other researchers from the, the gravitational wave department uh, called Hannah Middleton, and I told her I was doing audiovisual art, and she said, um, when black holes collide, they make chirp sounds. And I was like, wow, my mind is blown. And we just started hanging out. Um, and we didn't even tell the people who had organized the, the engagement kind of uh, seminar till probably three months later, we were just sort of, I was going to the lab and chatting to these guys and seeing what they were doing. And we've become really good friends, actually. Hannah's now moved to Australia. Um, I did Shambhala Festival last week with John. We had Aaron Jones, who's helped build uh, a lot of stuff, uh, along with Connor in the lab. Um, and Connor is here for, for this event. And so uh, we're having loads of fun, sort of hanging out. And um, I started building a, a modular synthesizer to make some noise with it. And what I was going to do originally was try and get the, the interferometer to modulate the synthesizer. But what it turned out was that, the, like he says, the, the sort of vibrations are in the audio kind of re region. So I ended up using the modular synthesizer and the low frequency oscillators to modulate that and use that as the voice. And it's become this amazing voice. We, we, we've got it over there. We're just tinkering with it. So there you go. Like the whole of the millions of years of, of gravitational uh, of, of black holes colliding at that point makes a chirp that quick. But rather than use the sounds, um, the digital samples of that, a lot of kind of artists use digital data after the fact um, for making art and sonifying data from CERN and, and what have you. I really wanted to use it as an instrument. I wanted a live performance because everything I do is live because I like the chaos that that kind of uh, entails. Uh, and this is the chaos we've got in the dome. Everybody's been playing live all day and into the evening. Um, so there's a certain chaos, but out of that comes some real order. So um, I wanted to use the actual interferometer as this uh, instrument. Um, so we've done a few performances now. The next of which is actually at Newton's house, Woolsthorpe Manor, where the, the apple tree, or the reported apple tree, there are different stories as to whether or not there was really an apple, but the real apple tree from the real uh, story, it really is a story, um, is there. Uh, so we'll be playing there 
in a couple of weeks. It's really exciting. Um, so this was at the Future Sessions in Manchester, the Future Everything Festival. Uh, and Connor and Aaron came and talked to that. Um, and my girlfriend uh, has been brought into the project. She's a, uh, a PhD student in digital animation at Plymouth University, the IDAT Collective. And so she's uh, got gravitational, um, not gravitational wave data. She's got, yeah, she's got gravitational wave data and colliding neutron star kind of data. She's kind of animated. So we got this lovely kind of stuff. And these lovely spang noises that come along are the actual voice of the interferometer. They're coming. There, that's the interferometer. So I'll keep that playing. I'll turn the volume down a little bit. So, um, there's a lot of information flying around the system. There's the visuals that get OSC via um, a wireless router built into the modular. Um, and uh, I'm hitting the, the Mickelson interferometer, and it, it's a local one. Gravitational waves won't really register on this one. Um, but I'm also sending like LFO uh, kick drum patterns through a solenoid that is attached to the interferometer that sends out the patterns later on. So when the beats come in, and this video is incomplete, it's not the whole set. Um, and we've got that going later in the dome, if you want to come and look. Um, and so it all kind of, it's a living, breathing system. And then what the plan is, and we, we almost did it at uh, the Lunar Festival in the uh, Journey to Newtopia. Um, but they put us on too early to do the visuals. So we're, we're putting the visuals in the 360 degree space. So you're really in the kind of planetarium feel of a, a, a kind of performance. Um, and I think we build wrong. We build as just chroma, talking about the chroma touch dome here. So we've got the gravity sent. The plans for the dome next are to put this into 360 degrees and to uh, take it on tour next year. And the tour is going to go around the science festivals. It's going to do a bit of rural touring to places with village greens. We can put the dome up and all the kind of uh, art centers that are on campus around the, the place. And um, there's going to be a whole program of people using science uh, and research for live performance. People like Graham Dunning and his mechanical techno. And we've got a bit of that. Here we go. He comes up. So he's gone viral with this amazing thing where he builds a whole system of, of mechanical objects that are driven by turntables and hacked records. So he uses metal contacts here to. create some lovely stuff. Where do we go? So yeah. And it gets this lovely state where the whole thing is driven just by the kinetics of the, the turntable.
I've also been talking to Vicky Clark, who's got a lovely kind of materiality blog about um, all the stuff you can do with kind of physics and, and materials. And I'll go via that one. Okay. Has it got a link to it? It's just a uh, thing. So basically, we've got the synth running later, and everybody's plugged into everybody else, so we'll be showing that. And we'll be. Uh, here we go, materiality. Also, been talking to um, Professor Alice Roberts about turning the dome into a big uh, heart. Um, so that's where we're going to go with everything. Um, I think we're kind of out of time. Are there any questions? Yeah, five minutes of questions. Any questions? Uh, can't see any hands. Oh, there we go. There we go. Uh, yeah, sorry, I may have missed it, but um, did you say anything about the interferometer itself? How big is it? What is it made of? Can I make one? Can I play one? We've got one there. You can come and see. Um, we'll have did that you, all day. Did you make it? It was made in the labs with um, Connor and Aaron. Cool. And it's a desktop interferometer about so big. And um, it's like a, like a laser pen size laser in it with a small beam splitter and uh, an optic diode that picks that up. And then we amplify that into a series of modular kind of mixer bits that one, we can send the solenoid to vibrate it. Um, and two, read it back into a resonator so that we can then give it melody because you can give a volt per octave uh, pattern of, of notes in key to the resonated sound from that. So you can actually then give it a melody kind of pattern as well. Um, and then that goes into a lovely kind of uh, granular kind of synthesizer that then sort of spangles it about and spreads it across the stereo field. So it, it actually becomes a synthesizer more than just a, a, a percussion instrument. But it does do these lovely percussion sounds. Um, and it's all flight cased and very portable. Um, yeah. Any more for any more? So just to uh, add on to that and uh, the technical side of it, yeah. Uh, the one we have over in the tent, which you can come have a look at, uh, uh, that is quite professionally done. I mean, it'd be quite difficult to make that. But at uh, Birmingham, we are working on a way to get uh, a sort of more general, sort of easily assembled one that's fairly cheap. Uh, because for the one through there, the mirrors, uh, to get really good sounds and qu uh, visual quality, you really need uh, quite expensive mirrors. The bean split a proper bean splitter will be a few grand. Uh, but uh, of course, that's if you want like really research grade. Uh, we are working on uh, having little almost like Lego play type builds where you get just like cheap mirrors and a little laser yeah, a little laser pen and you actually build up with Lego. Uh, but uh, I mean if you look on the website uh, you'll you'll see information about that. But yeah, the one for the one we've got through there, like Elian said, it's quite small. It's tabletop, the arm length is about 50, 10, 15 centimeters. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the the ones that detected gravitational waves at LIGO, uh, they're four kilometer arm length arm lengths. So uh, they're a bit more difficult to make. Uh, Six, 16 with the mirrors. Oh yeah, well, yeah, so the, the, the tunnels themselves are four kilometers, but the power's recycled, so I think they believe the total path length of the light is about 16 kilometers, yeah. Yeah, so they're really, they're in vacuums as well, and they're suspended by glass wires, so that there's no electrons that will vibrate them. And it becomes so small a measurement that it's almost quantum mechanics because it's like almost imperceptible. This is why there are two facilities. It's at Hanford and Livingston uh, in different states. So they both got to go off um, for it to work. And there's now Virgo in Italy. So um, they are expanding. Um, yeah. 
Okay. Um, everybody, big round of applause for Leon and Connor. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. Just, uh, just a little Thanks. reminder that EMF is entirely run by volunteers, so if you're having a nice time at the festival, please consider donating some of your time back to helping things run. I think we especially need people to do basically everything this afternoon. But um, yeah, thank you, and another round of applause for these guys. Thanks.